So today I'll be talking about a fine-grained approach to algorithms and complexity, and at the end I'll try to tie it up with uh, what you as cryptographers study. All right, so what are the problems that I'm going to talk about? Well, um, I love algorithms, and what, what do people in algorithms research actually study? So when you open an algorithms textbook, what do you see? You see, the following, and this is the fundamental questions of algorithms research, is how fast can we solve fundamental problems in the worst case? Okay, so I'll parse it for you a little bit. You probably all know what it means, but let me do it anyway. To, so we're on the same page, page. So we have some function we want to compute. It's computable. We have some reasonable model of computation, such as a Turing machine or a random access machine. This reasonable model of computation defines base, basic primitives, uh, which take constant time per operation. And now we want to compute our function on n-bit inputs uh, on that machine. And now we, we want to know how many operations does it take to compute a particular input, and what is the worst case asymptotic running time, that is, as the length of the input grows, what does the runtime look like? And in particular, we want to get a handle on what is the best running time that we can achieve with an algorithm. Now, what, what is our holy grail? It's a linear time algorithm. So some algorithm that runs in uh, time that's linear in the length of the input. Um, and why is this interesting? Well, it's for most of the problems we study, we actually have to read the input. So therefore, it's asymptotically optimal up to constants. So this is what we want. And the good news is we have a huge tool of techniques and many problems we can just solve very fast. So we've developed a ton of different um, tools. They have a wonderful toolbox and we can just use it. You give me some problem that you want to solve, I'm going to try to throw all these techniques at it and I'll come up with some algorithm, um, yeah, and so on. Now, unfortunately, there's also this big algorithm called exhaustive search. This is the first thing you try. Now, in, for, more, for all problems in NP, for example, you have a natural notion of a verifier. Well, that is, when you, when you'd have, you have a, a solution to the problem, the verifier checks it, right? So this defines the notion of a search space. And there is this algorithm, the exhaustive search algorithm, that just brute forces over the search space. And this is, uh, and unfortunately for many problems, this is the only way we know how to solve them. There's no significantly faster algorithm. And the, even in the 50s, Gödel wrote a letter to von Neumann and he asked, can we improve over exhaustive search in general for the problems we care about? And we don't have the answer to this question. And this is something I really care about, um, and this is what this talk is about, partially. Okay. So, uh, as I said, for many fundamental problems, we just don't have a very fast algorithm, not even anything that improves upon the brute force algorithm, the exhaustive search. Okay. So, I will try to hand wave a definition of what I think is a hard problem, and then I'll narrow it down a little bit. So, Roughly, a hard problem is a problem where our techniques get stuck. We just can't solve it very fast. And um, what are these problems? They're problems that come from all over the place. They come from very diverse areas. And um, they have a very simple, often exhaustive search textbook algorithm. What do I mean by this? Somebody gives you the problem, you throw the known tools at it, and you come up with a very simple looking algorithm. Usually it's just exhaustive search, sometimes maybe like breadth first search or whatever. But it's very simple, and if you had seen it in the 50s and 60s, you would have come up with the same algorithm. Unfortunately, for many, many decades, um, nobody improved on this runtime significantly. So this is what I mean by hard. So it's very easy to come up with some solution, yet improving upon this solution seems kind of difficult. All right, so let, let me give you some examples just so, so we see what's going on. So here's a canonical hard problem in computer science. This is the satisfiability problem. You're given n Boolean variables, you're given a formula in conjunctive normal form, so you're a bunch of clauses, and you want to know if there's a Boolean assignment to the variables that satisfies the formula. Now, um, 
What's the exhaustive search solution? So the verifier just checks a given Boolean assignment. So the exhaustive search solution is to try all possible Boolean assignments to the n variables. And there's two to the n of them. And then, then after you try them, you plug them into the formula, and you get a two to the n times mn algorithm. All right. Now, what, what are the best known algorithms? Well, um, see here, k is the width of the clause, how many literals you have in the clause. And the best known algorithms shave a little bit over this 2 to the n. It's 2 to the n minus some constant times n over k times a polynomial in the number of clauses. Now, unfortunately, you know, as the length of the clauses grows, this runtime actually goes to the 2 to the n runtime. So even though we've worked really, really hard to improve this uh, running time for many uh, values of k, for each value of k, we have a different you know, running time. But as k grows, 2 to the n is where we're at. And we could have just done that by done, doing exhaustive search. All right. So um, SAT, CNF SAT, I consider it hard because there's no known 2 to the n to the 1 minus epsilon time algorithm for any epsilon bigger than 0. Um, where 2 to the n is the exhaustive search runtime here. OK. Now, here's another example of what I mean. A different problem. This time, it's a problem in polynomial time. So this is the longest common subsequence problem. You may have seen it or taught it in algorithms courses. So you're given two sequences of letters. The letters come from some finite alphabet, for example, A, C, T, and G. And roughly, you want to know how similar are these sequences. And one notion of similarity is what is the, sub the lo longest subsequence of both of them. A subsequence is a sequence of, le of letters that appears in the same order in both sequences. In other words, you can think of it as kind of an alignment problem. You place the letters on top of each other. You introduce some gaps, potentially. And you count how many matches you get. So the blue sequence is the longest common subsequence here. And this problem, because it's a sequence similarity problem, pops up all over the place. You can think of um, biology applications. For example, someone gives you two DNA sequences. You want to know, are they close to each other? Somebody writes down a sentence, introduces a bunch of spelling mistakes, and you want to know what is the true sentence, and so on. So there's lots of examples. Now, it's a very simple problem. It, there's a textbook quadratic time algorithm. n is the length of the sequences, and you can just run dynamic program and you get n squared. Now, if, if you work really, really hard, you get a slight improvement of n squared to the divided by log squared of n, which is very small. Unfortunately, um, neither of these algorithms are particularly fast if n is huge. And we, remember, we want a much faster algorithm, like linear time. But again, I consider this problem hard because n squared was very easy to achieve, yet nothing better than n squared to the 1 minus epsilon is known for any epsilon bigger than 0. OK. And all right. So now I can redefine what I mean by hard. What do I mean by hard? You have these very important problems. They have some simple algorithms. You would analyze them. You get some function t of n that's much bigger than linear. And there's nothing better than t of n in the exponent known found in many decades. OK? And there's a lot of these problems. You can just come up with an example, you, and it's very easy to come up with them. And I want to know why are we stuck, OK? Are we, um, is it because like really these problems are in, intrinsically hard? or because we just lack the techniques. Also, more importantly, are, the, are we stuck for the same reason? Now, if we were stuck on these two problems for the same reason, maybe the reason is that there's just the one algorithm out there. Somebody's going to hand it to me, and I solve all the problems that I ever need to solve. OK, can I show this? And how can I even address this? So well, this is what this talk, talk is about. All right. So what I'll do now, I'll, I'll show you two approaches in complexity. I'll tell you why they, they don't quite work, and then we'll modify one of them to make it kind of work. So as you probably know, 
for almost any model of computation that you pick, Turing machine, random access, access machine, and so on, you can prove these theorems. For example, we can show that for any C, there are problems in n to the C time that are not in like n to the C minus epsilon time. And there is even tighter theorems known than this, um, and they're just beautiful. However, if I give you my favorite problem, whatever it is, maybe it's sat, I can't even show it is not in linear time. Just the lower bound techniques that we have in complexity are in, seems insufficient to prove such things, and now maybe sat is in linear time, who knows, but we don't think so, yet we cannot prove it. So, so we have to deal with this lack of techniques, so we have to do something else. All right, so then there's this other thing called NP completeness that we all know and love. Uh, I said why I think KSAT is hard, but the reason why you guys maybe think KSAT is hard is because it's NP hard, not, not because of what I said. Uh, and people really believe P is not equal to NP for various reasons. Uh, and so because of this theorem, the KSAT is NP hard for all K greater than or equal to three, and we, because we really believe that P is not equal to NP, it must be that KSAT uh, cannot have a polynomial time algorithm, otherwise P would be NP, okay? So it's a, um, this, what, what we have here is the reason why it's hard is because of this condition that we really believe, and, um, and the reason why we believe it is because if you read Cook's paper, he said it's just, in, we can't possibly think that we can solve all of these wonderful problems in NP in, in polynomial time. It's just impossible, yet if you could do this with SAT, now they would all, all be in polynomial time, and therefore I think it's, it's hard. So this is why. So what we want to do is, is have something like this for the problems that we care about, right? We want to say that the reason why I think longest common subsequence is hard is because, well, if it weren't hard, if I had a faster than quadratic time algorithm, then I could solve all these other problems and I, I don't think I can do that, or, and so on. So we want something like this. Now, can we use NP hardness to do this? No, because, well, you can't, uh, you can't have a problem that already has a polynomial time algorithm be NP hard because otherwise P, could, would, P would be equal to NP. So we cannot use this particular hardness, but we'll do something like this. Okay, so let's uh, just revisit very simplistically what NP hardness means. So NP hardness just, you know, starts by assuming a particular hardness hypothesis. Let's say P is not equal to NP. Then you use reductions to show that if your problem Q that you think is hard had a fast algorithm, a polynomial time algorithm, that P wouldn't be NP, equal to NP, and therefore we, we say that this Q cannot have a polynomial time. It must require a super polynomial time. This is what the three steps are, and we'll, we want to mimic these steps in our approach. Okay, so this is what I already said. We, if we use these three steps, we cannot show that problems in, a, in quadratic time are hard with this approach. So we will, we'll change it. All right, so let me take a step back and say, why did we even care about polynomial versus non-polynomial in the first place? Is it because we thought polynomial is efficient? No. N to the 100 is not efficient, neither is N squared in practice if the N is really large. So the reason why is for other technical reasons. For example, remember I said that when we analyze algorithms, we have to fix the computational model. But if we only talk about polynomial versus poly not polynomial, we, we can afford model independence because there's theorems that translate between computational models and they have polynomial overhead. And because uh, this is one very nice reason to think about polynomial versus not polynomial. But for me, I fixed the model, so I don't really care about this. Okay, another reason is because if I define efficiency in terms of be having a polynomial time algorithm, then when I compose an efficient algorithm with an efficient algorithm, I get an efficient algorithm because polynomial over polynomial is a polynomial, right? But for me, maybe, maybe efficiency is linear time, and then I, I can't use this thing. Okay, so 
what we'll do, as I mentioned, we'll develop this more fine-grained notion of hardness that will distinguish uh, between different polynomial times, so different times in general, different functions of the running time, of the input size, and then it will be conditional because um, we still don't have the techniques to prove unconditional lower bounds uh, and will kind of mimic MP hardness. All right, so what I'll do now is I'll um, give you the fine grade approach that we've developed. And uh, the way I'll do it is I'll go through the steps of NP hardness and give you the corresponding steps that we have in fine grained hardness, just to, to see that there's kind of a direct correspondence. All right. So here's just like this uh, cartoonish view of what NP hardness is. Uh, you have an assumption, P not equal to NP, or equivalently, SAT doesn't have a polynomial time algorithm. Then you have this reduction step, which says if your problem Q had a polynomial time algorithm, then SAT would as well. And then you conclude with this conditional hardness because you believe step one, uh, by step two, you must have the Q cannot have a polynomial time algorithm. So here's what we'll do instead. We will have some other hardness hypotheses, okay? They won't be P not equal to NP, it will be something of the form. I pick a problem H, for example, SAT, that I think is really, really hard because lots of people have worked on it, okay? And then I'll say, let's H of N be the textbook or exa exhaustive, uh, exhaustive search runtime for this problem, uh, and then I will assert that H requires roughly H of N time, h of n to the one minus little of one time on inputs of size n on, let's say, a RAM. So I fix my machine model. Then what I do is I have a reduction step. When I want to show the Q is hard, then I reduce this problem h to Q in such a way it will imply that if Q had a faster than Q of n time algorithm, where Q of n is the natural runtime for Q, then I would get a faster than H of N time algorithm for problem H. Both of these algorithms would run in on the particular model of computation I picked. And then finally, I get my conclusion that under this hypothesis, Q must require this much time on the RAM. So these are the three steps. So uh, it's not very well defined right now because I haven't told you what these hardness hypotheses are. I haven't told you what the reductions are and so on. So what I'll do now is I'll go through these steps one by one. I'll tell you what hypotheses we usually pick, and then I'll define this fine grain reduction formally, and, I'll, and then I'll give you some consequences, things we know about from, from this. Okay. So um, as I mentioned before, SAT, we know it's a really hard problem. But not only is it NP hard, but people think it's really, really hard. Uh, and there's these two hypotheses that have been formulated about SAT. And one of them is the exponential time hypothesis. It says that there's no sub-exponential time algorithm for SAT. And then, uh, equivalently, there's no delta such that three SAT, for example, cannot be solved into the delta n time. There's another one which is truly stronger than this one. It's called the strong exponential time hypothesis, and if true, it would imply a TH as well. So strong, the strong exponential time hypothesis, or Seth, roughly says that CNF sat on n variables in a linear number of clauses requires roughly two to the n time. The original uh, formulation is something like this. For every epsilon, there's some clause with K, such that K sat cannot be solved in two to the n to the one minus epsilon times poly in the, in the number of clauses time. So this is some uh, hypothesis and it just says this brute force two to the n running time is essentially optimal. That's all it says. And uh, what we'll do is we'll just use these hypotheses and see what follows. That's one of the things we can do. But uh, just one thing you have to remember what we are assuming here is much, much, much stronger than P not equal NP. Okay, it's not only does SAT have no super polynomial, it doesn't have a polynomial time algorithm, but also it doesn't have a better than two to the n runtime. So two to the n and polynomial, they're very far apart. Your, your assumption is a two to the n. 
Yeah, it's like it's very, very super strong. Yet somehow it is still believable. It's still possible that two to the n is required. Yeah. So let's see. Um, also, I just want to point out the nice thing about these re reductions implications, as you all know, is that if I if I have some implication and somehow I get a better algorithm, I would refute this, and this is very meaningful anyway. So okay. So uh, besides these, there's three other problems that we have worked on. So it doesn't exactly matter what they are, but I will define them. What's important is that a lot of different communities have worked on them. They're extremely simple, and their algorithms are also extremely simple. So here, this one here, the threesome problem, it's a problem which is, has which is, um, become at the heart of many research papers in computational geometry. So you're given n numbers, let's say they're integers. And all you want to know is three of the numbers sum to zero. And there's various ways to solve this problem in n squared time. n squared log n is super easy. You just try every pair of numbers and check if the negative of their sum is in the set. And the hypothesis here is that uh, threesome requires roughly n squared time. Uh, there are improved algorithms n squared over log squared of n. Uh, however, log squared of n is tiny, and we don't have an n to the 1.999 time algorithm. OK, so this is threesome. There's another one called orthogonal vectors problem, which, again, is super simple. You're given n uh, vectors. They're very short. Their dimension is, let's say, a little bit more than log n. And you want to know if the two of these vectors are orthogonal. Moreover, these vectors, their um, entries are either 0 or 1. So, um, and the brute force algorithm just tries every pair of vectors, computes the inner product, and checks, you know, is one, one of the pairs orthogonal or not. Uh, this gives you n squared times d. Now, there, there is an improved algorithm. This is a little bit hard to parse, but basically it says that if the, the dimension is actually order log n, you get a better than n squared algorithm, n to the 1.999, depending on the constant in front of the log n. But once the dimension becomes bigger, faster growing than log n, this is no longer truly faster than n squared, and it motivates this hypothesis that orthogonal vectors requires n squared time, essentially. Now, um, one thing to point out is that Williams in 2005 showed that if you believe the strong exponential time hypothesis for satisfiability, then you should definitely believe this one because you can actually reduce sat to orthogonal vectors so that if you have a faster algorithm, faster than n squared for sat, you get a faster than 2 to the n, sorry, faster than n squared for orthogonal vectors, you get a faster than 2 to the n for sat. So, so this is a really believable hypothesis here in fact, even if SAT had a faster than 2 to the n algorithm, this hypothesis might still be true. So it could actually be very believable. Yeah? I mean CNF SAT with a linear number of clauses. However, actually, this, uh, if, you, if you extend this hypothesis to say there's no n to the 2 minus little of 1 times poly d time algorithm, then uh, actually even full CNF set would. Um, but it's still CNF. It's still CNF. Yeah. So there are other hypotheses we could, we could, there are better hypotheses, but in this talk, I'll just talk about CNF set. Good point. Um, all right. Finally, the third slightly different problem is all pairs shortest paths. Classical problem in graph algorithms, we teach it, study it, and so on. Again, you're given an n node graph. It has weights on its edges. Let's say they're even polynomial in n. And you want to know for every pair of vertices, what is their shortest path distance? There's like many, many different ways to solve this problem in n cube time, and is the number of nodes. Um, and there's a slightly faster than n cube time algorithm, like uh, by Williams again, in n, n cube divided by the exponential of square root log n. But this is still not n to the 2.99999. So there's this hypothesis that has been around in the graph algorithms community um, that says all pair shortest pass requires roughly n cube time. And another thing is that these three problems are 
central to different communities in computer science. This one has been in computational geometry, this one in graph algorithms, and this one is essentially a set disjointness question, if you think about it. So it's, it appears all over the place, databases, people care about it a lot, for example. So, okay, so these are these three other problems, uh, and uh, so this answers, like, what, um, what are the central problems we care about. Now, you may ask, why three? Why don't you just have one? Yes, I'd love to have one. However, there's some research that suggests that if you strengthen strong ETH a little bit, then there will, there's no deterministic reduction between these two three problems. So at least there's some barrier to showing that these are equivalent. So it's possible that we need more than one problem to explain the hardness of things. Now also, if we allow more hypotheses, of course we'll be able to prove more, but I want to restrict it to have fewer, so let's just stick with these. All right, so we've covered this. Um, and now, the most technical part of this talk will be one slide, which will talk about what a fine-grained reduction is. Uh, yes? This is all for worst case. You can do the same thing for average case, but you need to be a little bit more careful. So, yeah, I'll get back to it. Okay. All right, so let's, let's do it. So, uh, in order to get there, let me remind you of the two main notions of reductions we're used to in NP-hardness, for example. So there's the menu one reduction, which essentially says, if I have A and B, and A is menu one reducible to B, if there's some polynomial time algorithm that takes an instance of A, it produces an instance of B, a single instance, so that the answer of B is exactly the answer to A, uh, and A and B are decision problems. So this is what a menu one reduction is, um, and, Maybe we could do something like this, except poly n, maybe we can put something in there. However, this sort of reduction has a variety of weaknesses. So, for example, I can't take a function problem and reduce to a decision problem in this way, because just naturally, this, the answer to b has to be the answer to a, and uh, moreover, if I, even if I slightly generalize it, if I have a problem like all pairs shortest pass where I have n squared answers I have to, n squared distances I have to return, I can't reduce it to a decision problem by creating a single instance, because the single instance just gives me one bit answer, and I have to answer, I have to give n squared log n bits, in fact. So we can't exactly use this, and I want to be very general, and I have to, I want to have uh, problems that are equivalent no matter what their range of answers are. All right, so because of this, let's take Turing reductions instead. So in Turing reductions, now I'm allowed, for every instance, I run a polynomial time algorithm, and I produce many instances of B, okay? And now if I had Oracle access, so some magical being gives me answers to the instances of B, then in polynomial time, I solve A. So this is a Turing reduction. Um, and this is more along the lines uh, of what I want. The reason why people don't use it is for technical reasons, right? Because it doesn't distinguish between NP and co-NP, for example. But um, for us, it's better. However, it's still too coarse grained because it doesn't really care about the running time. It just cares about polynomial versus non-polynomial. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take Turing reductions, and I'm going to make them more fine grained. All right, so here's a notion that we came up with in 2010. So imagine you have two problems, A and B, and you think that the natural runtime for A is A of N, and the natural runtime for B is B of N. And I want my reduction to be so that when I take, if I had a faster than B of N time algorithm for B, then I would get a faster than A of N algorithm for A. All right, so. Uh, let's define it then, the, the reduction I want to have. So A and B are problems, and little a and little b are sometimes constructible functions, okay? There are the run times. I say that A is AB reducible to B if for every epsilon there is some delta, so epsilon is the advantage you want to have over the B of n time algorithm, 
so then for every epsilon, there's a delta, and an A of n to the 1 minus time, delta time algorithm that can solve instances of A of size n by making oracle calls for B. This is the Turing part. And here's a picture, OK? Um, so you take an instance of A, you run some A of n to the 1 minus delta time algorithm, it produces instances of B They can have various sizes, n1 to uh, n sub k. And there's this funny condition over here on what their sizes can be. And the condition just says that if I had a B of n to the 1 minus epsilon algorithm for B, I can run it here on the instances instead of the oracle. I just run the algorithm here. And because the, the runtime over here will be just the sum of B of n on the, all of these instances, right? OK? And this, if this is less than A of n to the 1 minus delta, and the reduction time producing the instances and getting the answer back is A of n to the 1 minus delta time, then I get an A of n to the 1 minus delta time algorithm. OK, so this is the definition. And two prop, uh, propositions immediately follow. Well, the first one is that if A is AB reducible to B, and B is in B of n to the 1 minus epsilon time, that A is in A of n to the 1 minus delta time. And also conversely, if I believe A is hard, then B is hard as well. If A is hard for A of n time, B is hard for B of n time. All right. The second other nice property is that it's transitive. If A is AB reducible to B, B is BC reducible to C, then A is AC reducible to C. Okay, Have all, there's lots of nice properties you can get out of this. And now you can start reducing things to each other. Now, um, I want to take a step back now. You have this fine-grained notion. And imagine that now I start, I, I have all these problems in front of me, all the problems that you ever care about. And I know what their natural runtimes are. And somehow I use this notion to reduce them all to each other. There's currently no reason, convincing reason to believe that you can't do that. So now you can now have everything be equivalent to each other. And really, there's only one problem, you see. And also, there's only one algorithm. It's the exhaustive search algorithm for that problem. So we could live in a world where there's only one algorithm and only one problem. And maybe this is how we'll do it. All right. You never know. <laughs> OK. So what we did is we picked some harness hypotheses. We have some notion of reduction, and now what can we prove? So what, what were people able to prove for SAT? So well, first Cook showed that all of NP is reducible to SAT. And then CARP got 21 problems and said that they're all equivalent to SAT. And this started NP completeness. All right. And then more stuff happens. Many, many problems were added to this. And also, you can reduce SAT and to problems outside of NP. There's a beautiful theory out there. Now, the beginning of our theory is not as pretty. So we don't have 21 problems. Well, maybe we do. I haven't counted. But we. I only counted 20 in the Ah, you were paying attention, you know? He's very really smart. OK, so what's going on here? There's <laughs> there, are, there are indeed only 20. The reason why is the Hamiltonian cycle had two versions, undirected and directed. So, so that's why. <laughs> very good. <laughs> All right, so um, yeah, so what do we know? So we have these three problems, four if you count that, but you know, we have this implication. So from the 90s, uh, threesum has uh, been shown to imply hardness for many problems in geometry. This started with a paper by Gadgetan and Overmars in 95. And they said, well, let's assume that this simple problem requires quadratic time. Can we show that all these other problems also require quadratic time? And indeed, they do. And it spawned a lot of uh, papers on this topic. And now many, many problems in geometry are known to be hard under the threesome hypothesis. Um, recently, more recently, we started showing that if you believe the threesome hypothesis, then problems outside of geometry are also hard. So you can use uh, some other techniques to also show things about sequence alignment problems and so on over here. Uh, orthogonal vectors 
the sedge darkness problem I mentioned, it has many, many implications. So since we, since we started this work, we showed, we and others showed like, uh, for example, longest common subsequence, it requires quadratic time under the orthogonal vectors uh, hypothesis, uh, lots of problems, subtree isomorphism, graph diameter, and so on. So it's a very, very fruitful hypothesis to start from. So you get a lot of stuff. Um, and one of the interesting he things here is all pair shortest paths, we actually have an equivalence class. So there's all these problems that are actually n cubed, n cubed equivalent to all pair shortest paths, and you use the full power of fine grain reductions here. So this problem in white over here is a very simple problem. So you're given a graph on n nodes, and you have weights on the edges, there's some integers. And I want to know if there's three nodes that form a triangle, so there's edges between all three of them, and the sum of the weights on the edges is negative. Okay, I can easily solve this problem in cubic time. I take every triple vertices and I check the condition. Is it the sum negative or not? Yet there's, this, there's nothing better known. And in fact, if you could solve this decision problem, is there a triangle there? Then you can compute all the distances, all pairwise distances in a the, in the graph very fast. So it's very nice. And it also kind of led me to believe, actually I don't know if I believe, but let's put it out there. Um, suppose, Maybe, maybe you can take a problem, and maybe the natural algorithm for it is not exhaustive search, but it's possible that it's just fine-grained equivalent to some problem whose best algorithm is exhaustive search, just like here. All pair shortest paths, the, the search space is enormous. There's so many shortest paths out there. Okay, exponential number, yet we can solve it in cubic time, and the, really the reason is because it's equivalent to this triangle problem. And there it's actually a cubic number of things in, natu in the natural search space. But anyway, I digress. Let's get back to this. So here, uh, and also, you know, there's all these problems that are known to be hard under all three hypotheses. There's problems uh, that are not only about static inputs. Sometimes the inputs change and you need to update the runtime and then you can show tight conditional lower bounds for such problems under one or more, more of these hypotheses. So, uh, this field is really growing. There's a lot of results out there. How, what's my time? Okay, good. All right, so, um, and again, as I said, if you use more hardness assumptions, you can prove more, but even with these, you can prove a lot already. Okay, so now I'll spend the next 10 minutes or less on the conclusion. Um, good. So what's the conclusion? Well, uh, first, besides what I told you about, there has been um, kind of an explosion of research on this. And people started applying fine-grained ideas in, in uh, places where it's not really about running time. So sometimes you may care about how much space your algorithms use, uh, what is uh, like the trade-off between approximation and runtime and other stuff. Also, uh, in different models of computation, like IO complexity or data structures, and also there has been a little bit of work on fine-grained cryptography. So I'll mention a few things that people have done in this domain. Okay. So um, this paper by Ball et al., they had two papers in 2017 and 2018, and they were concerned with can we build some cryptographic primitives out of the fine-grained assumptions that we have? Okay? And in particular, our assumptions, as was pointed out, are worst-case assumptions. So can we get average-case assumptions and build crypto out of them? And what they did was um, they developed these techniques where uh, they could get these other problems out of our three things, out of all of the orthogonal vectors, three sum and all pairs of this pass, they were able to get related algebraic looking problems that are actually hard on average in under nice distributions. Okay, and then they were able to get proofs of work from them, which is very nice. And the theorems that they proved were something of the sort. Uh, you can generate a challenge in like roughly linear time. Um, you, there is a way to get a proof of work and then to the k time for some small k, and then uh, you can check this proof in roughly linear time, and every proof must require roughly n to the k time. Okay, so this is very nice, and this is exactly what one cares about. 
Um, yeah, and so the, then the question is, uh, can you get more out of this? Can you get, besides proofs of work, can we get other cryptographic primitives? Could we get public key encryption and so on uh, from this? Now, unfortunately, from their approach, there, is some, there are some barriers to even getting one-way functions, uh, but it doesn't mean that you can't do it. Maybe there's a different way to go about it and get different average case hard problems to get there. All right, so then um, there's another problem. So what if I ask, I take my favorite problems, orthogonal vectors, three sum, and all pairs, shortest pass. Can I show that they themselves are hard on average for some nice distribution? Um, and this would be nice because I don't go to these very messy looking algebraic problems. I just, I'm stuck, I will be with the, working with these very simple combinatorial problems that it's easy to work with. Unfortunately, it's not too hard to show that for many natural distributions, orthogonal vectors and all pair shortest paths are actually not hard. There's much faster algorithms for them on average. For example, if I take all pair shortest paths on a graph uh, where you start with a complete graph and you put weights on the edges which are between zero and one, there's some real numbers, then you can compute all pair shortest paths in n squared time, which is optimal because the input size is n squared. So also orthogonal vectors, if you sample your instances by, uh, you have some probability p bigger than zero, and you sample your instances by putting the, making the coordinates, uh, uh, each, uh, each entry is zero with probability p or, and one with probability one minus p or the other way around, and then you can actually show, solve that problem in two to, n to the two minus epsilon time where epsilon depends on p. So, yeah. They, they could still be hard for other nice Absolutely. I'm saying, and in fact, this is a great question. There is a nice distribution for, and for orthogonal vectors. If you assume that SAT is hard on average, then I, do, I perform my uh, reduction to orthogonal vectors and I get a distribution for orthogonal vectors under the assumption that SAT is hard on average. So there exists some, some ways to do it. Yeah. Yeah, they're correlated because you have these clauses and so on. So they will not look nice. Maybe it's the right thing. Uh, maybe it's the right thing. I mean, but why not start with SAT? You know, it's I don't know. Uh, it's a, it's a great question. This just uh, this all this is saying is that for these very nice distributions, they're easy to solve. There could exist some other distributions you can work with very well for which they're not that easy to solve. But we haven't worked. We haven't uh, looked at it very closely. Now. What I want to say is that, as I mentioned, CNF, SAT, and 3SUM, they might even be hard for the simple distribution. For example, 3SUM, uh, in fact, I'll show you in the next slide, but 3SUM could just be hard by, when, if you take your integers completely at random from a large enough range, uniformly at random, we still don't know how to solve it faster than in squared time. So there's some very simple distributions for which these problems could be. So the question is uh, whether uh, these problems are conjectured to be hard over finite fields. So orthogonal vectors is actually not hard even in the worst case for over random or over finite fields. You can solve it in subquadratic time uh, for any finite field. Um, over rings, it is hard, like over mod six. Okay, not rings, whatever. Yeah, you know what I mean. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, where was I? So you could start working with these two problems, even with the simple distributions. Um, of course, we would love to have worst case to average case reductions, and this was done recently for a particular version uh, of these problems, namely the accounting versions. So instead of uh, the decision version where you want to know whether uh, there is a threesome solution, whether orthogonal vectors, there is an orthogonal pair, I want you to count the number this is a much harder problem, okay? But then you can actually get uh, a worst case to average case reduction. In particular, uh, Goldreich and Rothblum did this just recently. I think this is a very exciting result. And I think this, I think this should be true for all these problems that the, the, the counting version should be hard on average, so. Um,
Absolutely. For every fixed prime, it, it's, it's solvable in n to the 2 minus epsilon time where epsilon depends on p. Like the prime grows, but then one sure, yes. If p is very large, then yeah. it's probably hard, but then you might as well work with the real version. Okay. If p is large. <laughs> okay, good. So this is where we're at. Now, we don't have very nice worst case to average case reductions for um, the decision versions. Very good. So what if I just assert that they're, that they're hard on average, and then later hopefully prove that they are? What, does, what, if, what follows? Can we show something interesting that follows? So for example, let's take this problem three sum, which is related to subset sum, okay? But uh, for three sum, we could make this assumption, which is completely plausible with respect to all we know. So what is the assumption? You're given three sets of size n. Each is drawn uniformly at random from minus n to the d to n to the d. Think of these like 100, okay? Um, and then, we say that every subquadratic time algorithm that's supposed to solve three sum on the instances makes a mistake, like on half the instance. Okay, could be, this could be true. We don't have algorithms ruling this out. Does this give you anything new in cryptography? So we know that you can build crypto cryptographic primitives from subset sum. We have these results. But can you also get uh, ones from three sum? Um, and this would also be interesting. So why not? And maybe someday we'll prove this, this is fine grain hard. I don't know. But we don't know. OK. So in conclusion, um, I mentioned that this field has been growing. And I'm really excited to see what's next here. I, I don't know what's going to come next. And I hope you guys can help. All right. Thank you. I, yeah, if I believe these, I should definitely believe the hardness versions, the algebraic versions. Yes, I think they're probably much harder, actually, than these ones. Yeah. Yes? What are the kind of hard problems for fine-grained space complexity? For fine-grained space complexity. So, um, so actually, it's a good question. So you know the threesome problem? Uh, if you consider algorithms that take square root of n space, less than square root of n space, uh, then uh, actually it turns out that the threesome hypothesis is equivalent to the hypothesis that algorithms that take uh, less than square root of n space must take n squared time, which is, seems more believable, right? But actually, it's the same. Uh, so the question is, is there a notion of a shortcut for these problems where if you know the shortcut, then you could get a better algorithm? So, uh, so one thing I can think of is, uh, suppose your input has some special structure and you know what it is. For example, uh, if you have um, a graph, let's say, and it has small tree width, and I have the tree, width, tree decomposition, then I can solve it faster. And, and there's actually... So secret. A secret, okay. Um, okay, I have to think about it. I think yes, I think the answer is yes, but I have to think about it. Okay. Uh, could you go back to the slide, please? Uh-oh. The, the one that uh, gives the, uh, it's up? This one? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, maybe I don't understand, but it seems to me that if D is large enough for fixed N, then the probability that when you choose these sets A, B, C at random, uh, Becomes vanishing. Yeah. Therefore, an algorithm that always says no. Then we should set D equals three. Yeah. 
Sadiq or Sutri. How does this not contradict what you're saying? And same guy who the yeah. says no. Well, I, not, what I need to do is change half to something that depends on, on D. I need to change this half over here. You're right, it's a mistake here. But this half over here depend, should depend on D, on how large the thing is. But for D equals three, it should be like some constant. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Oh, oh yes, okay. So what he's saying is I am talking about this fine grain notion where I have a function to the one minus epsilon. He's saying, uh, does it make sense to also talk about improvements in terms of polylogs, in terms of the constant factors and so on? And yes, it does make sense. And in fact, some of these fine grade reductions do preserve polylogs in so many instances. And you can use this to show very strong hardness. So um, you can show, for example, that the longest common subsequence problem, if you get a faster than n squared over log to the 10, for example, n algorithm, then very strange uh, results in circuit complexity come about. So you can, you can actually do this, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm, I, I didn't go into this. Yeah. 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 How large can So how the say Oh, so I, I don't remember exactly what the dependence of epsilon on P is. Uh, I think I'm, I, I'm going to say the wrong thing. It's probably so, it's some polynomial in P, but I, I don't know, inverse polynomial. But I don't remember. Maybe it's quadratic. You have, you have to check the paper. Yeah. Thanks again.